Hi, Cam followers. Thanks for joining us again this evening. We are going to continue tonight with our owner's guide to hydrotherapy with Barbara Holding. She's back again. <laughs> and she yesterday came on and started with some really interesting information and really useful as well. We've got lots of great feedback from um, people that have been watching it saying you know, it's really built, built their confidence or made them happier about the, the whole process. So yesterday, just as a recap, we covered um, how to find a therapist how do you go about referral to a hydrotherapist and what you're looking for um, in a hydrotherapy center? So we're going to move on a little bit now. We did get some more questions from people that were watching uh, overnight or, or throughout the day. And I think some of those questions we will end up answering as we go yes. through what we're going to talk about this evening. But if we don't, then I will try and get to it. And again, as last night, if you have any questions, please pop them in the comments and we will try and either put them in as we're talking or, or get to them at the end, if that's all right with you, Barbara. Yeah, that's fine. That's great. I think I think the main thing is I want to make sure I answer all the questions that you gave me, because when you went and did your research, pulled all those questions off from yeah. everything that you've ever been asked, I went, whoa, but we do need to answer them all. And that's so important. Yes. So people have got that information. So yeah. thank you so much for having me back and for Cam um, inviting you. me for another episode, which is really exciting. And thank you so much to everybody who's giving up their time this evening to attend. I really appreciate it. And I got so many emails um, giving their apologies for people who couldn't make it tonight. And that was lovely. And they're going to watch it on replay. So I know yeah, a few just, of them had a few problems with the replay finding yeah. it. I was just going to say that just now, actually, um, on the replay, if you do have issues, then just message us on the Canine Arthritis Management group and we can guide you how to do it. And we'll try and make it quite clear as to how to get onto them. All of our Facebook lives go onto our YouTube channel as well. So Canine Arthritis Management have got a YouTube channel um, and they normally go on a couple of days later. So if you want to go back and look at anything, just need to put it in the search in YouTube and it will it will definitely come up there maybe easier if you struggle a little bit on the on the Facebook page so if you have any problems do message us and we will try and sort it for you yeah that's brilliant so, please don't message me about tech no <laughs> it's not my skill base. Us <laughs> and I will pass it on to somebody who knows a lot more than I do so that's fine we can always sort it out so we're going to stick with hydrotherapy. Obviously, that's what we're all here for. Um, and we're going to talk about one of the biggest questions that comes up in Holly's Army this evening. Um, but first of all, I'm just going to ask, we're going to first of all talk about what happens in a hydrotherapy consultation, in a hydrotherapy session. Um, and the question that, the big question is, just so we have this in the back of our minds, what happens if my dog hates water or if he's really anxious if I'm not with him? And I think this goes quite well with when we're talking about how the session works, how we can maybe help or um, ease the worries of people that have those concerns. Yeah, I think that's yeah. really a, such an important question. And like you say, it comes up time and time again. If we yeah. go to the poster, so I'm really excited about the poster. Let me um, it's, it's changing all the time. Um, and we're building it with you. So we're kind of being very responsive. The only thing is once I go to the poster, I can't actually see the comments. So I'm not ignoring people. I can see lots of people saying hi. So it's wonderful that people have attended the live. So if we just go keep down. An eye on those. And so you can see episode one, the cam questions that we were asked, we've kind of covered. And then from the questions we had yesterday and the, the questions that Cam have given us, We've now gone into episode two, and it's about the canine hydrotherapy sessions. I think a couple of questions have come up, which we will definitely be covering next week in episode three and four. So yes. again, are you able to post the, in case somebody's new today or they haven't got the the poster link, are you able to just post that, repost that in the comments? Yeah, Nikki? yeah, and pop that in the comments, yeah, that's So fine. people, you can open this poster and you can see all the questions that I've been asked to address by Cam over the whole four sessions. And um, and thank you, Sarah, also for, uh, who works with me, who's sitting there in the chat, just watching for any um, other questions so we can sew them into one of the episodes. So as you said, really important. What should I expect at the first session? I'm really worried about my dog being very anxious. 
And this is where you need to negotiate and have that communication with your individual professional. Because the first thing is that you, if you're anxious, you are going to definitely influence the behaviors of your dog. So the professional hydrotherapist you're going to see before that you arrive for that first session is going to have that discussion with you maybe on the phone or you've started a, a communication through email and that's mm -hmm. something the owner needs to raise then their concerns that the dog's very anxious or a bit worried about water and this is where that meet and greet of 10 minutes for the owner and the dog to come into the center you know the the dog to be able to sniff around the environment to meet the therapist to have that discussion for them to then explain how they deliver their service and what they're going to do to address that. There should be no situation where a dog turns up for a first session, and <laughs> disappears and just, you know, panics. So, yeah. and, and then the other thing is a lot of owners are saying, um, you know, I want to stay with my dog and, and that's a choice and that's really important. So you need to find a service that can accommodate that. Yeah. Um, and it, it, before we've had the pandemic and lockdown, that was very straightforward, but it's more complicated mm -hmm. now. So different services might not be able to offer that at the moment. So if yeah. you're starting for your first time anew at a rehab center, I, I think that the key thing is communication with the therapist and, mm -hmm. and let them know so they will then understand that that dog needs more time and it may be that first session the owner mustn't have the expectation the dog's going into the water. If the owner knows exactly what's going to happen and it's going to be, you know, being familiar with the environment, um, the therapist might use something called clinic enrichment, which we advocate and, and teach lots of professionals to use. They just, just like any kind of um, enrichment work, um, yeah. clinic enrichment is enriching the clinic and the therapist moving within that clinic environment to optimize um, that experience for the dog. So they're really comfortable with it. Um, yeah. So I think it's all about communication um, and, Can I just and ask building a, that trust. Yeah. Just a little question here. Um, yes. Do you find, I don't know if this is a, I don't, hope, I don't want to offend anybody through this question, but do you find that sometimes the owner is more anxious about how their dog is going to be than actually how the dog ends up being? Do you, do you feel, if that makes sense? Yeah, and I think that comes down into one of the questions just down below um, where um, people, which is a little bit lower, but people say, like, my dog loves water. With this expectation, they're going to love the therapy session or my dog mm. hates water. We have so many dogs that have come to our clinic over such a long time and we've been told one or the other or they hate water, they hate a puddle. However, going into an environment where you've got a therapist, where the owners meeting for the first time or maybe the second time and mm. a dog it's a new experience that professional will have the skills to be able to um, work within their clinical space and help the dog settle down and it may be they need to be really clear with the owner there's no expectation of going in the water we're going to get the dog familiar with the equipment today and we're going to let yeah. it sniff around and scent so uh, you know owners have choices of where they go professionals have choices of where they train where they go and do their cpd how they practice what service they offer so it's a communication thing but yeah. we do know and research supports that if the owner is anxious and worried it will be transmitted to their dog who then yeah. doesn't get anxious and worried who may then show behaviors that they're worried why is my why is my owner so stressed Oh, yeah. there's a person, that person is really worrying my owner and then yes. you might have a different kind of behavior. So it's not that they'll be worried, they may change their behaviors to protect their owner. So communication is yeah. the key. Yeah. So do you, just a quick, another, sorry, quick question. Do you say to people, um, you know, when you come in, yes. if they are very anxious, do you say, mm -hmm. I want you to just try and relax because do you explain that to them that your dog yes. is going to pick up on your behavior and but yeah. that's part of that's part of our therapeutic handling and clinic enrichment that we use so we very okay. much ask the owner not to relax because that's really hard if they're anxious we yes. just explain if you could be neutral so wherever they're going to be we ask them to be neutral so not kind of kissing and cuddling their dog or yeah. reaching over or using tone to placate the dog it's going to be all right they won't hurt but that's our communication with the owner to explain 
in a yes. way that owners are comfortable with and they yeah. understand. And then, you know, and then we reassure that we're not going to do anything with your wonderful dog. We're going to explain everything as we go along and explain what we're doing and why. And it's like a story unfolding. And we just yeah. want that experience to be really positive so we can start building that professional bond with the dog of confidence and trust so then they'll work with us in a calm and focused way. We have yes. lots of manual therapeutic handling and touch work that we use to help the dogs have those exper positive experiences. So yeah. it, it's building, it's a story unfolding, it's building that trust and confidence with your owner and mm. with the dog. And it, some dogs it takes time. You know, we've had some dogs that we have done lots of work with them in that clinic until they're ready to work with us with consent, we would never force a dog or push it into flight or fright. That isn't yeah. appropriate. So, no, goodness, no, that'd yeah. be awful, yeah. But but equally it's fool around, you know, a dog bounds in and it's fooling around and messing around and it's doing everything yeah. to avoid it. You know, those dogs need containment, not restraint, and they need yes. to be handled therapeutically so they can kind of find that, okay, I love this, my tail's wagging like mad, but I know for this bit, I've got to just work with that therapist. You know, so yeah. it takes time and it's an individual thing. And it's just as important to support owners as it is the dogs, because you know they this is their loved dog, their family member. Of course. And yeah. so they need the information and maybe they need to hear it first before they turn up and then yeah. have an introduction. So some owners need more opportunities, whereas other owners, you know, it clicks a bit quicker. So it's so individual. Yeah. It's a really good tip though, isn't it? If you yes. don't feel like you've got enough information before you arrive, yes. don't wait until you walk yeah. in the door, ring up or no. email and get that information because it can yeah. then make or break your session basically, can't it? If you, yes, and if so many professionals, you know, in their centers offer this facility. And now, particularly with this last year's being really challenging, you can have video calls, telephone. Yes. You know, if you're not very good on the telephone, you know, as I said, I've got a really serious hearing issue. So I really stress on these kind of things that I can't hear your cues auditory because I can't see you. Um, yes. So video calls, you know, and lots of owners have hearing issues. So yeah. finding a medium that works really well. Mm. I think that's important. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So sorry, carry on with the in the session. So that, this is the you okay. get there and you know what so to expect. You should have a lot of prep. You will have had your session protocols. It would have been described what's going to happen in that session and, and what, you know, and also now with the pandemic, there's a lot of the assessment history taking is done on video calls. So they've built up an understanding of what the expectations of the owners are, what they're looking mm -hmm. for. They've described what they can offer as a service. There's a real sort of sharing of information between the owner and the therapist. Um, and then you'll have your session protocols. You know, they'll they'll identify that they they definitely want you to bring certain things. They'll definitely want to make sure the dog when's the dog last eaten, not eat before the session, um, being toileted, expectations of whether they'll be drying the dog or not drying the dog. You know, how they're going to leave the clinic, how long it's going to take the session. I think this is where it's really helpful for owners to know it's not about the minutes in the water. It's the whole session from the beginning. They come in until yeah. the moment they leave the session runs that whole time and the skilled therapist you know uses that whole experience to build a very positive bond with that dog so then when they go into the water and they can ask a bit more of the dog um the dog can you know it's a strange environment you're going into water with a stranger in a wetsuit and it's yes. warm <laughs> yeah. and you're only this sitting there or whatever. Yeah. So it's, you know, whether they love water or not, it doesn't really reflect what's happening in that, that session. And it's about that therapist building that confidence and trust. So the dog will walk, work calmly and focused with their direction. And, and yeah. that's the key thing to safe practice. Yeah. 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 Um, and just to touch on, uh, there were a couple of questions yesterday about yes. dogs getting in and out of the pools. And we were saying, yes. or you were saying about basically it needs to be safe um, yes. for people and for the dogs as well. Yes. So what's the common way or are there different ways that you might get the dog into the pool? What, what should we expect well, to that's, see? Yes. And I think the therapist should go through that with the, with the owner. And that really mm -hmm. depends on their experiences, the therapist experiences and training as well, and the access they have into their equipment and what equipment they're using. But there should be safe access. 
we use our access into the pool and into the treadmill therapeutically. So we have therapeutic ramps. Um, and, you know, we covered that in episode three about the equipment, okay. like is the pool ground level, half in, fully out, you know, so just we're going to cover those kind of questions. And they're okay. really helpful for the owner to understand. And seriously, in this day and age, they could just have some video of the therapist practicing on their own dog if they if it's confidential not to show another dog so they could see this process and then everything's sorted because then if there's any issues from the practice they see on a video they can yes. raise that and, and ask you know but for for us how we work is that we therapeutically use the access as part of our treatment and it's calm yeah. focused and our hands are on that dog at all times and the same with the exit because they're the very tricky bits of movements yes. for the dog so yeah, they're quite demanding, know, aren't they? Yes, yeah. really complex sequences for the dog to do compared to walking mm. forward in a straight line, which is its, its easiest movement pattern. So, mm. and that's why owners, you know, it's really important that the therapist has discussed what are the owner expectations yes. and what's realistically we can offer with this service. So yeah. there's a real understanding of the benefits. What are they looking for in the service? So you address these right at the beginning and they don't flag up later on. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, is that a good point to move on to what we should be expecting from these sessions for our, our arthritic dogs? Oh, yes. Now, I think if I, where, where, where are the questions? Is that kind of a little bit further down? Yeah, I don't I know if we, we want to. That down there. I mean, are you happy to move on to those or there's still? Yeah, I can, I can move around this. We've kind of, you know, put it together in response to the questions that you sent us. So it's, yes. it's honestly yeah. not a problem. So it's a big question about what, um, you know, you don't want to over, over, well, you, you don't, you don't want to expect something that you're definitely not going to get. And again, this comes back to the biggest thing by the sounds of things, the communication right at the it beginning. Is. It is, I mean, and that's but that professionals are really highly skilled at that, and so they're yeah. going to be addressing this. But essentially, looking at the benefits of the hydrotherapy, I think the key thing is what does the owner want out of it? They've got, say, a 12 year old Labrador retriever, you know, called Harvey, who's got multiple medical issues, and he's also got arthritic issues that has now affected his mobility and he's losing his back end a little bit. Maybe mm. that kind of scenario. What what is the owner looking for to be a four year old bouncing around or to be comfortable, to be able to toilet independently? And it's really hard when you're an owner and you're seeing your dog, you know, deteriorate. Yeah. It's really hard. So maybe they need to have that conversation. What I'm hoping for is that my dog can independently toilet. I don't mind helping a little bit. I want my dog to really enjoy you know, the joy of movement and the joy of going out to the forest, but maybe I'll drive them there rather than having long walks and, and yeah. understanding what they can do at home. So I think that comes right at the beginning, the communication, what are the owner's expectations mm -hmm. and being able to negotiate with them. Actually, this is what we can offer. It's not a panacea, just like anything. Yeah. It's a multimodal approach yeah. where we're all working together to help, I feel, the dog be comfortable, happy, enjoy its life and be the best physical version it can be, but also realistic if it's a 12-year-old yes. or 14-year-old dog. It's going to be really different to maybe what you can help and assist with like in a four or five-year-old dog. So yeah. because, you know, ageing as well as underlying issues has an impact on movement, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and it's going to be very individual, isn't it? Like you were saying very last individual. night. As well. And this is why it's so important to get all the information from the referral, because if they've got heart disease or skin yes. or, you know, or any other issues going on, that the expectations for each dog has to be managed on a on a individual basis, doesn't it? Absol absolutely. And that's the key thing is that's why you need to work so closely with the vet and have that underlying medical information or any other. And you'll gather that the therapist is going to gather that in their assessment phase. They're going to do some thorough history taking. They're going to look at the, the medication. You know, they want a record from the vets of what they're on. You know, is this multimodal approach is working together. It's not this versus this. It's like putting no. the ideal package together for that individual dog at that moment and yeah. then see progression and then maintain what they've achieved so yes. there's different kinds of um, treatment packages that the therapist will offer so that's the other thing so it all comes down to that initial communication and, and building that through the sessions as well because 
it, it, some dogs have got such an enormous history it's impossible to know everything at the first session so mm -hmm. but you collect a lot at the beginning and then it's that continual reassessment and checking how they got on and you know you're expecting to see progress every session yes it's yeah. how you and measure it so progress that. doesn't necessarily mean the dog can suddenly toilet the second session but it does mean something will have changed or altered so that's yeah. that build up of communication between the therapist and the owner yeah, and then the owner, I find, often does come back when they come back in for their acupuncture or for their pain management um, check. They say, yes. oh, the hydrotherapist said this this week. And they're so happy that, yes. you know, that, that they've been told that there's been this improvement or or they, they, have, they can see um, what they thought would happen or what they hoped would happen. Yes. And it gives people a real buzz, doesn't it? So you're constantly yes. assessing and reassessing. Re reassessing. We assess throughout every session and reassess at the beginning of every session. Um, yeah. And the first thing we ask, you know, the, the therapist is going to ask you, you know, when did they last eat? Have they toileted? Yes, we kind of get that out of the way and make sure that's being addressed for that dog because it's different times yes. for different breeds and different ages and different problems. And, yeah. and then it's like, how have they been since the last session? And that's going to be a conversation. And that, that might yeah. be remote now, you know, on yes. the physio or on the phone, or it might be be at the session. Every therapist is going to have their own particular way that they um, do this. But that's that information. And the other thing is the dog is with the owner at home all the time. And when you see your dog every day all the time sometimes you don't sort of no. spot the subtle things and they're very True. subtle changes it's not a massive difference it's going to be a subtle yes. thing like and they'll go they played with their toys and they haven't done that for three years or yes. you know actually they didn't collapse backwards into their poos and peas they managed to get up and move forward and you know just those little things actually they're standing for their food a bit, bit longer but normally yeah. you know it would be only nine seconds and so those are the things that are very important to us they're real markers to say we are progressing but yeah. the owner might not understand that at that time but once you highlight it they can really go oh and i saw this as well but they're seeing their mm -hmm. dog all the time whereas we see them over a period of time and and then a gap so really we will see those that. yeah we'll see those and so we highlight them and then the owner's able to build their eye at looking for that as well yeah, yeah. i think that actually brings us on to one of the other questions that we were getting um you know some people say we've been doing hydro for six months and we can't see anything how do we know if it's making a difference and again i would just i would say we need to go back to what were you expecting to see in the first place what were you hoping to achieve and maybe you are actually achieving those things because some of them are just going to be really tiny changes. Like you say, yes. standing for a longer period of time before sitting down. Yes. I think so, it's, the expect so it's going back to the therapist. And, you know, if you've got to that point and you're you're asking that question on a social media site, mm. definitely book an appointment and go and have a chat with the therapist. Because yeah. if, if you don't communicate that to look, we've been coming, I'm not seeing anything. And that's where they need a discussion to kind of share well actually this is what we're seeing or not and and if they they sort of do feel that it, it's not working for them you know that's it should flag up to the therapist you know i expect yeah. an improvement every session i would never expect it to be detrimental i would never expect the dog to be stiffer or worse after the session if that ever happened that's a red flag and i'm going to have a discussion with the owner with my team and find out why have they not progressed or you know we're moving Why towards that yeah yeah and they shouldn't yeah. it shouldn't happen yeah. so that's the key thing we were discussing yesterday two things safe and effective it's beneficial yeah. um and so that's where you'd really look at your assessment what are we missing have they got is something else going on that's not been spotted so yeah. there is an expectation that every session should be positive and productive for the dog's physical you know um, improvement yeah. And I guess in that vein, it means that because arthritic dogs are so up and down, uh, yes. no session is going to be the same. It's not going to no. be uh, write it down and this is how you're going to do it, is it? It's oh, uh, you know, therapy is a science. It should be based in science, science based information and facts like how the, the dog moves, the biomechanics, its functional anatomy, understanding how that um, underlying conditions or condition can impact that dog's mobility. Um, and then there's the art of selecting the appropriate assessment tool or the appropriate treatment tool 
to devise that individual program. So every single session is going to be tweaked or changed or it's not prescriptive. It's, you know, yeah. 20 years ago, sort of, well, 30 years ago, it was like, you know, in human practice, like we've got a knee, what do we do? We do this, this and this. Th those same, kind of protocols same. have gone, you know, that's nothing to do with current practice. So yeah. each session is going to be slightly different and, but it's always going towards, you know, the, it, it depends, is it rehab or is it maintaining what you've attained? So if it's yeah. rehabilitating and it's an acute problem, the progress is going to be really different to if it's rehabilitating and it's a chronic longstanding problem. Mm -hmm. And it's also going to be, um, you know, when you've got to that point, it's maintaining it. And then with your lovely old arthritic dogs, it can be really influenced by the environment, the weather, you know, maybe a, a slight trip, maybe the muddy um, walking, it just it, it's this balancing act to get the right session for each dog. Yes. The key thing is never to overexert senior dogs. Never, yeah. always less is more. <laughs> High quality, less, and to improve their physical movement, definitely. Yeah, and would you say that it's um, it, it's okay and normal for them to be tired after the session, but they shouldn't be uncomfortable? Well, again, that's going to be part of the therapist talking to um, the owner, you know, during the session, what's happening. And then afterwards, you know, um, they'll be saying, you know, it's really important that you keep them warm if it's a cold day. Um, and you need to find out the status that they're going to be when they exit. Are they going to be dried off? We, we don't use a blower because a lot of dogs are noise sensitive. Um, right. But we will we we tell them they're going to be towel dry, but we need you to bring a, a a drying coat to put them on and we make sure the car's parked really near for our older dogs and they yeah. don't get a chill. And then when they go home, it's not about, you know, going out for walks. We'll be very clear on what exercise for that particular dog is is appropriate and that they can drink but not guzzle water, but they have to wait a time for um, to have a meal. So yes. that, that home program, depending on that therapist scope of practice, will extend from the sort of information like that to maybe a more um, comprehensive um, sort of exercise program, depending on what their qualifications and their experiences are. And yeah. then they'll be directed, you know, there's an expectation they've worked with the therapist doing therapeutic um a treatment they are going to be tired but they shouldn't be yeah. exhausted they definitely shouldn't be exhausted that they sleep for all this afternoon and all tomorrow and those yes. are the things that the therapist is going to use when they come back in the second time to help them understand how that treatment package worked for the dog so they can tweak right. it so yeah. that's again it's all about communication that's the key good yeah. communication sharing information and sometimes the owner might not know what to say, but that's the therapist skill of using open questions and having that conversation. Yes. Yeah. And I think that the one of the big messages to take home here is if you feel like you're not getting enough information, don't be shy. Yes. No, no, no. But this is... But but in the in the UK we're very <laughs> we're very British and we tend to go well oh, yeah. maybe I'm not meant to know so this is about empowering yes. owners to know they're allowed to ask questions it's Definitely. really important and they're allowed to ring up the therapist and have a chat before they come the next time and you know yes. again I put that in the um, session protocols the pre support what do they get how are the owners supported before they come um, do they have a courtesy call do they get a call from the therapist how do they communicate if they want to chat about how their lovely dog was the next few days if they've got any concerns what do they do all yeah. of that sh will be covered by the professional canine hydrotherapist for sure and, yeah. and the terms and conditions usually there's a lot of information about advice or advice sheets what you need to do or not do because it's really hard for the owners to remember everything so to have something written yeah. down is so useful and you're very yeah. emotionally invested when it's your loved dog you know and you kind of come out and you analyze it and you sort of see your dog. And so to have that that ongoing support from the therapist is so important. Yeah, it's part of the team, isn't it? It's the whole part it is. of the team. Well, I have, I have a bit of a battle because, you know, I believe, and I always have, that the owner is part of the MDT. It always yes. has been for me. Whereas other 100%. people kind of say, no, it's just a professional. I'm like, no, no, no. The owner is like the expert about this dog. They've got so much information that we're offering them a service they're purchasing a service from us we want to do the best yes. so we're going to work together and for me the owner is absolutely in there with the dog as part of the multidisciplinary team yeah I agree because actually you know what well for, as a vet you know there are things that I would suggest or um we, we trial we do 
and then you get feedback and you think well no okay that that isn't what we need to do for your dog but it is what I would do for another dog in the same position but yeah. as a yeah, every individual person yes. dog they, they are individuals and what suits one person or dog is not going to suit the other so yeah. you have to have that feedback and that information back from the owner don't you in order to get the most effective program that you can for, and, for and I think dog. also for in the UK, I, I'm not sure about everywhere else, but in the UK, they've gone through lots of stages to get to canine hydrotherapy or canine yes. physiotherapy. So the owners are there because they really want to be. Every really owner that comes through that door, you know, it's the professional's responsibility to find the best way to communicate and use the appropriate terminology and give them that support on that journey. And, and you yeah. can see the owners you know, flourish on that journey with their dog as well. Everybody's working yeah. together and it really it really matters that owners are empowered to ask the questions that they want to, uh, yeah. to because also the time frame that canine therapists have with owners is quite a wide time frame. So with all due respect, but I don't know if you have 10 minute consults or 15 minute consults, but you know, we have like half an hour and hour, we have our sessions. So you're going to yeah. have lots of opportunities for the owners to raise questions because sometimes they're anxious about asking something or they're not sure yeah. if it's relevant or they kind of build up to you know i'm just gonna the say big this yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's giving them time as well definitely yeah so plenty of time and the bottom line is don't be british about it just <laughs> come out and say it I know, I know. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's terrible. You know, if you've got anybody, you know, a professional knows, if they've got someone who kind of comes and then they go through it and you never hear from them again, there's a problem there. You yeah. Know, if they don't come for the follow-up, something's happened that they've kind of gone not doing that again. So, they've been put off, yes. Yeah, so it's really important to, you know, um, have these opportunities to build that relationship with the owner and then it all works so brilliantly. Yeah. Definitely. So can we just go through um, what some of your objectives for the arthritic patients you see? So I know you were talking about, you know, improving um, their making them the best that they can be. Yes. And, and talking about making them comfortable, comfortable to yes. toilets. And um, we hear a lot about uh, muscle strengthening. Uh, what uh, how many groups or what, what sort of things do you most commonly work on in more a bit more specifically okay so it's it's very much the individual assessment so the the key thing is treatment doesn't happen without an assessment the assessment is fundamental it is we are assessment driven we collect that information through history taking we observe then we'll have um, palpation and maybe some special testing and again it depends on your scope of practice whether you're a physio and a canine hydrotherapist yep. or a canine hydrotherapist you work within your scope of practice but you're still going to do a physical exam um, as a as a hydrotherapist they're going to do health checks they're going to do a whole range of different things and from that information that huge amount of information they're going to bring together a prioritized problem list. And that prioritized mm -hmm. problem list is gonna be only relevant to that particular dog, and it will include the owner's expectations. And then from that problem list, they're going to set some goals, some treatment goals. And so they're going to identify in that priority, what can they do? And then yeah. those treatment goals give direction. So it's a clinical reason pathway. It's not just like, I've got this and we'll do We'll, we'll go in the, the water and just kind of swim around randomly. It's very yeah. organized. And so depending on their, their, um, their status, they're going to have a treatment toolbox full of assessment and treatment clinical tools. And they will select the most appropriate for that dog of that particular breed, sex. So the segment of the dog is paramount. So what's the age, the yeah. sex, the breed, the coat, because that very often coat colors give you an idea that they can be quite temperature sensitive as well okay. you know and the older dog obviously they've got normal aging process are going to be very yes. different to a younger dog and and what is it has driven the owner to come for hydrotherapy that's the key and it, yeah you know it's not like oh the stifle has got a little bit less range of motion i want a bit more exercise there it will be things like my dog's really struggling getting up in the morning or i'm noticing for that older arthritic dog you know they're struggling with toileting they're I've noticed they're not cocking their leg or um, rising after exercise. They seem a bit stiff or it just takes them a little while to get going. So that part of the assessment is so crucial because that's going to give us such a clue 
on what yes. we need to address. Prioritize. So, yeah. yeah. And they'll, they'll say, but I don't understand it because they see the squirrel and they run flat out. But that's mm -hmm. their emotional and drive and behaviors. Yes. Their yeah. physical self actually says, okay, but now I can't move for two days Shouldn't because you've got that. the squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just like when we overdo it. So, that, yes. you know, so understanding the needs. And then when you've got um, a, a senior dog, for us, it's very much looking at their balance ability, their mm -hmm. coordination of movements. They'll have maybe muscle atrophy, but you know, it, you can't start a strengthening program from that point. What we're going to yeah. do is look at their balance coordination and switching on those very weak muscles. And there's lots of amazing clinical tools that are so brilliant for kind of identifying that and actually actioning that. So right. what, what we do know is that the weaker muscles switch off first. So by going further and doing more, you think you're strengthening the dog, but you're just strengthening that secondary pattern that's taken yeah. over, that is dominating the dog where they've kind of got a wider stance at the front and they're hiking themselves up because they're not designed to pull from the front. You know, no. so it's, it's helping that dog with the functional tasks. So I think it's very worrying for owners when they struggle to toilet independently or they're yes. falling backwards or can't get up and though so those are the things those movement sequences the the canine hydrotherapist will understand what goes into being able to do that movement sequence they'll yeah. chunk it down and they're going to practice particular parts of that movement sequence to improve that toileting mm. do you see what i mean so the, yeah yeah and that might not always be especially like yourself when you're practicing you're doing your the land-based physio and the hydro um mm -hmm. It may not be that they spend very much time in the water at all if you know for some of those sessions, I suppose. I, I think for canine hydrotherapists, they might not be in the water very for anybody who's yeah. doing canine hydro, we know it's not how big the pool is, it's what you do in it, and we know it's yes. not how long you do it, it's the quality, quality. of the techniques that you do. And so, yeah. you know, you may have an older dog and they're going into that water environment and there's different kinds of work. There's static work. So think of it as a human analogy. You know, mm -hmm. if I've had an uh, operation and the physio comes over to me to get me up, they don't just hoik me up and make me walk up and down. And they definitely don't make me go backwards or pull me back. No. It's all about forward motion. What they would do is sit me up and I would um, do some sitting balance. And then I might do a bit of coordination and then I'd have support. So the static work is so crucial and that's the most tiring. Yes. And then yes. there's the dynamic work, which is the movement. And so they'll put a package unique to that dog's needs. And if they've got toileting issues, they're going to do techniques that will be help the dog manage part of that sequence. So then when the yes. dog goes onto land, their toileting is easier. It's not about you know making a dog a swimmer or, or yeah. walking them a yeah. lot. It's about therapeutic techniques to improve their land-based function so they can yes. be comfortable. So it's got a big part of pain relief as well. It's very proprioceptively enriched. So we know that influences the quality of their movement. And mm -hmm. you get to strengthening later. That's later on. At the beginning, it's about getting the joints to function. And I can yeah. tell you with stiff joints myself, stiff joints are horrible. It, it doesn't sound much having stiff joints, but they're really horrible. So it's easing that stiffness. But you might, yeah. you might have an, an older dog that hasn't had full range of motion of a joint for a long time. You're not suddenly going to do mm -hmm. full range of motion work. You're going to do the range of Building motion that's relevant to the dog. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So I guess when it comes back to um, just pointing this out again, I suppose, that if you're booking your hydrotherapy session, and, and I've heard this before, you know, well, the dog only spent two minutes in the pool. That doesn't mean that you're not getting no. your money's no. worth of your session. There's so much more involved. Yes, just there's, the, there's the whole process from the moment you come in, that professional is using all their professional skills to communicate, to assess. Um, there'll be some analysis of the movement before, during, after, but it's got to fit the dog. So if you've got an elderly yeah. dog that can walk 10 paces, you are not going to do a formal gait assessment no. because, you know, so free movement tells us a lot. Of, a lot. We do a lot of free movement within um, the enclosed room for the older dog. And you can, can you just see, tell us, you, yeah. can you just describe for people that may not understand what, what free movement means? Can you just tell us more about what that is? Okay, so formal gait assessment in dogs are very flawed because it's very unreliable and the validity of it is quite poor, whereas because their breeds are so different and we don't have very many normal breed um, databases that are normals, we don't know the normals for all the different breeds. So yeah. um, it gives you some information, whereas in the horse, because the horse is really a sizing issue, but very similar, yeah. um, that's very reliable. Whereas with the dog, 
you know so if you've got an assessment that's going to take a while you don't want most of it being used for gate assessment if it's not that reliable and valid you'd want to also have palpation you know observation your know, special testing as well so free movement is allowing the dog to move in a contained area because especially an older dog you can see when they're moving on the straight in that space and then they go to turn if you've got a developed tie. So that could give you some useful information as well as movement on a lead. Um, and it yeah, depends it how they move on a lead. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it depends who's moving them and how far. You don't want to exhaust the dog so they've got nothing left to actually work with you yeah. um, therapeutically. So it's, it's yeah. a balance. Yeah, I think that, that makes it a bit more clear. Um, so I just... Are there any conditions, especially for older dogs, or times when you would say, no, hydrotherapy is not for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hydrotherapy is not a panacea. And, you know, if, it, if it's not being beneficial, if you've been reassessing and you feel you've plateaued, or very, very often, like um, with rehab as well, you'll find you'll improve, then you plateau, then you yeah. then improve, then maintenance is keeping it there. And people say, well, I don't really see my dog improving, but I'm on this maintenance program. Well, they might not until they take that away and then see the dog deteriorate. Yes. So I think being proactive rather than reactive is a very positive way for your older senior dog to optimize their movement and keep it there consistently yeah. rather than them going up and down. Um, and most people, when they've been through like quite rigorous rehabilitation and seen their dogs really struggling, when they get to a place where that's working really well, they want to keep them there. So yeah. they may be on a maintenance package. Um, so it depends what you're um, using hydrotherapy for. But right at the bottom of this bit before episode three, yeah. what is it not appropriate for? What's going to happen is the therapist is going to use their assessment findings that we've talked about. And this is going to include something called a risk assessment. So there's two kinds of risk assessment. There's a, a risk assessment of the environment that most people know about. But there's mm -hmm. also something called dynamic risk assessment. Um, and that's on the spot risk assessment of, of the dog because it, it's all about safe practice. And the assessment findings, the risk assessment is going to determine if hydrotherapy is appropriate for that dog. And right. they're going to all the therapists will have trained and they'll understand that the precautions and the contraindications of therapy of this kind mm -hmm. of therapy. So a precaution is where there's a raised risk. So this is a complex dog. Uh, rather than the routine case. Um, they may right. have underlying medical problems. They may um, have behaviors around water. Um, these are things where we need to put in more health checks, maybe extra staffing, diary manage it more carefully, um, give more time for, for the, the session. So we have a moving, flexible time. If the dog needs longer, we give them longer. We have mm -hmm. a identified time, but you know, Dogs don't perform to the minute. So if no. they get longer, they get longer. Um, yeah. And then there's the contraindication. And that is where the therapist says, this is not appropriate. This will not be safe. It's not beneficial. Not now, that could be a contraindication could be that a dog's been coming for hydrotherapy. It's been very successful. And the owner rings up in the morning and goes, my dog's got diarrhea. And the therapist is going to go, it's, it's contraindicated. Well, they won't say that word. Today. They'll say, actually, yeah. today we're going to reschedule because it's just not yes. appropriate you know so yeah. they will understand that they you know they won't be ch they shouldn't charge their owner because the dog's been vomiting and got diarrhea you know they'll they'll reschedule it and yes and the owner for letting them know rather than turning up and going by the way they've got diarrhea because you can't yeah and then it's too late yeah. yeah 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 or, or it may be um on a hot humid day and you've got a brachycephalic breeze sorry like a boxer and yep. they those ones clearly in respiratory respiratory distress and they shouldn't even yes. be out and that, that should have been prevented by good diary management and you know that should, shouldn't actually happen but it might be that the dog's got a large open wound um, or skin infection so or they're in season so th yeah. that would be contraindication whereas a yeah. precaution is where there's more risk so you're going to put in lots of strategies, which includes therapeutic handling, you know, um, appropriate use of health checks um, to make sure they're safe. And if the therapist yes. then decides it's not safe, they won't go forward. It doesn't happen. That, that's part of being a professional is the therapeutic yeah. canine hydrotherapy that you're going to administer has to always be safe and yeah. should be effective. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's really it's an, again an, another important point because it's not um it's not going to be appropriate in every situation so no. 
it's just that's just one of those things um i'm just going to go through a couple of these questions okay. here we've got this evening again um so a couple of these things we are going to cover next week so luke there's a comment here from luke about what are the benefits of treadmill versus pool are they indicated for any oh, particular that's, problems that's, yeah and that's that's really interesting there's so much to share with that we're going to do yeah. that next week i think so that's in episode in three Wednesday. i think yeah all about yeah. equipment and the different exactly. equipment there is how it's used and yes getting the best so come and see us then um, and if you bring all your questions then that will be perfect and um, but what we can do nikki is we can we can pull those questions off and put them into the poster so this poster is a living poster so you can see episode one and episode two have got pictures and we've kind of arranged it we're going to put everybody's questions into episode three and yeah. we've got a q a in four so we'll make yes. sure everybody's questions are addressed is. yes yeah um, so I've got a question here from Lindsay and uh, she's saying we had Hello, our Lindsay. nine and a half. Uh, can you see that that comment? Let me take this off for a second so that you can see. Yeah. I can't so see we had our nine and anybody. <laughs> girl to hydrotherapy after she had two ops to remove discs from her back and neck. I between times she had a visit to an orthopedic specialist as her toes on her back left paw were sitting at a funny angle. It turns out her flexor tendons are damaged and toes sit at a displaced angle. Though mm -hmm. The specialist said she isn't in pain with it. Would it be more damaging if we took her back to hydrotherapy as it really helped her stiffness episodes the last time? So I guess you're asking, is it more damaging for her flexor tendons now that that's happened, but you really want to do it because it helped with the stiffness the last time? Yeah, and I think that's such an important question. Thank you so much, Lindsay. And I think that's where you have to go to your vet and your therapist and everybody talks together because that stiffness that limits movement and mobility is such a big issue for your lovely dog. So that mm. needs to be addressed. And there, there may be another way to, to do that as well. So I think when we talk about the different equipment next week, that might be really interesting for people with, with older dogs because there's a growing number of um, amazing canine hydrotherapists out there using therapeutic showering techniques. So it's not always okay. about being in a pool or a treadmill. It's about doing techniques that benefit your dog. So there's lots of options, but I think that's about a conversation. Yeah. It, it's not about anything detrimental because the therapist would never do that. They're going to no. work really closely with the vet and it's going back to the vet, having a chat and, and going forward and keeping your lovely dog's mobility because yeah. stiff joints are incredibly limiting and they can build up quite quickly to yeah. for the back end really struggling with lots of complex sequences like rising after resting and toileting and getting into the car and getting over the step that you have to do to get in and out of the back door. So yeah. it's, it's there's going to be a lot you can do yes. to help with that without yes. doing damage to you. Absolutely. So yeah, like you say, speak to your vet and your therapist. Speak to the therapist you, you went to before because they're, they're going to know your dog as well. So... Yes, um, they, absolutely. We helped to help you. Um, it took my dog. So this is this is an interesting one from Shannon. It took my dog three sessions to be confident enough to enter the treadmill, but it was worth taking this time because he trots in very happily now, twice a week, and it has made a huge difference to the management of his conditions. And I'm guessing That's Shannon brilliant. that through the communication with your therapist you knew that just because the first time he didn't go in it didn't mean you were never coming back again it was just building up yeah. that relationship and that confidence and that's you know really thank you for sharing that because it's it's yes. very useful i would imagine to other people and for so. attending i'm not sure what time it is in australia but it's not maybe <laughs> the best time <laughs> yeah so, quite early thank you shannon it's, it's thrilling <laughs> to know that you know you got there in the end and i think that's the thing it's an individual negotiation with the therapist owner and dog each time yes definitely managing it each time um they uh yeah so this is again just showing how how amazing these therapists are um yes. stacy stacy says my boys get overexcited at his therapy sessions so the therapists are skilled at getting him focused so he gets full benefit of the session and yes. you know barbara was saying that at, at the beginning it's not just the dogs that are worried about getting in the water you've got yes. the opposite end of the scale as well and they're really tricky you know they bound in and they've got all that energy and you don't want you want to handle them in a really careful therapeutic mindful way to help them go oh actually I could just like work now with them so it yeah. and it takes a little time to get that bond but when you get it it's honestly the best job in the world it really is and yeah. um thank you stacy for sharing that really rewarding um 
There's got one here uh, from Pam. Good communication is imperative. Thank you for agreeing yes. with us there, Pam. I'm afraid my dog is a definite no for hydro, which I'm sad about, but we tried for six weeks to encourage hydro for him. The day after the first session, he was sick. Second oh. session, using treadmill, had diarrhea. <laughs> Unfortunately, oh. we had to try a different therapy, but I do think Barbara and hydro are made for each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Pam. Thank but, you. But, you know, there's um, always going to be those, those occasions where, yeah, you've tried, and you know yes. what? If you didn't try, you wouldn't know, and, and no yes. harm has been done done so that's the you know that's the most important thing there but I, ho I hope Pam you come next week as well and just like listen about the um, different equipment and a, a little bit more about the actual process of the hydrotherapy because you know but uh, thank you so much for sharing that that's really important yeah. and it's so important to know that for some dogs it's not appropriate yeah Totally. And it doesn't mean that they failed or anything. It's just, no, that's no, just no. the way it is, isn't it? Yes. Um, uh, no, that wasn't the one I was going to do. There's one really lovely oh. one here. And I wonder if you've had any of these before. Um, with Paul, I had a session today with a deaf dog that needed a lot yes. of encouragement from the owners. And it was great to see the bond between them. I mean, yes. yeah, I mean, that's just an extra challenge, isn't it? We've had a, a large number of blind dogs and deaf Have dogs. You? And do you know that the, this is what fascinates me about dogs? They're just so amazing, as well as being stoic and hiding things. They are just so bold and they just go out for it. And, it, yeah. you know, hopefully everybody here is agreeing with me that every dog got their own personality. Whereas mm. I, it wasn't that long ago, people said dogs don't feel pain and they have no personality. It's just a temperament. I'm going, are you joking? Every yeah. dog's got this amazing personality. And, and I think it's just a brilliant um, experience working with dogs. I feel so privileged to see them yes. move from being uncomfortable, struggling with things, to being quite bold and cheeky. And I love that. That means they're yeah. we're really progressing. They're enjoying so, it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And we're getting lots of comments like that, you know, initially oh, a little bit um, worried, but now very confident. I've got a couple of people asking about at the moment whether you can go in and, and stay and watch your dogs. And I think you were saying yesterday, Barbara, yes. with your um, clinic, you yes. have cameras that people can watch from outside in their cars. We, we give, or... Well, we're, I'm very, very big on choices. I believe professionals should have choices. I believe owners should have choices. You know, I believe dogs should have choices. Mm -hmm. And so we are very lucky with the build of our building. We've got a viewing corridor that we can socially distance and owners can come in. And we ask them if they would like to. Um, mm. Before, obviously, before all of this, they all came in. But we also used in. the first lockdown when we were shut to repurpose our building. So we put a lot okay. of strategies in place. Whereas I know some other vets near us couldn't do that because the building just doesn't lend itself yeah. to that. And we have yeah. very big consult rooms. So we kind of rejigged our whole center. And we also, you know, some owners, they might be shielding or they're not, it's not appropriate for them to come in. They can sit outside in their car and we've got CCTV on us and they watch it on, on you know, uh, on a device. So they can yeah. still witness and be part of that session. They have that choice. Which is really yeah. important. Yeah, very important. Yeah. So. Um, and I think there's another one about are they all open at the moment? And purely for what you've just, the reasons you've just said, not everybody yes. will be able to be open at the moment. No, and, um, and you know, so there, there's restrictions we see essential we, we, we count the the treatments that we're offering are essential to us because we know that the dogs would deteriorate but we can also work within the health and safety requirements we've got the appropriate PPE put in place you know and so it's an individual decision um, some centers are shut and some some are open so each mm. therapist has had to make that professional decision based on a huge amount of information yeah. from the government and from their um professional associations to support them to make the best decision yeah. so but hopefully as we were saying yesterday so a few hope. months and, and things yes. will be much much better um we have here kenzie i am joining Hi, late kenzie. and we'll go back and watch the video but when it's available my five-year-old lab was diagnosed with severe hip dysplasia at two. Oh, oh. poor thing yes and um, she's quite active and she attends rehab with underwater treadmill twice a week the facility where we go does not have a pool is there a time that i may need to look at finding a pool versus the treadmill i think maybe we'll answer that next week do you think yeah and Ke yeah and kenzie you know it, it, i think the thing is it's not about something versus something i think it's about the best opportunities for your dog and it's how With people use the equipment we're going to cover that in depth next week so please do come along yeah yeah, yeah. um let's hope we get out of lockdown yes absolutely marianne let's hope we do so nina's written um 
Nina's written here, I was surprised when my therapist suggested a session every two weeks. I didn't think there was much that could be achieved with only two visits a month. Is this frequency normal? I think I know what you're going to say here, yeah. which is <laughs> <Do you> <laughs> it's very individual. <laughs> okay, so it depends how they work with the dogs. I, if I told you I wouldn't very rarely see a dog more than once a week, it would have to be a acute condition, okay? You know, after that session, I I kind of have three days either side of it. A chronic problem, we might see a dog monthly and make a vast improvement to it. Yeah. So it's going to be we fit the sessions to what the dog needs and at what part they're going on. And then maybe they need a few sessions together. So we're very flexible. We never book ahead as in block bookings. We always book the sessions as the dog needs them and you should see progression. And we're gonna have that conversation with the owner, but every two weeks for us, we would make a massive significant difference for, for the different dogs we see. So, yeah. you know, for most of our dogs, uh, senior dogs, dogs that are arthritic, it might be once a fortnight to start off with, and then maybe once every three or four weeks, but really it's what the dog needs. And, and yeah. we're gonna find that out by reassessment. So that's one of the, the art of it. That's kind of shifting what you're offering for that particular yeah. dog yeah so it does it sounds fairly normal then nina for yeah for that for, for, for a chronic problem it depends you know and it depends but but again if you're if you're concerned about that go and talk to your therapist because then they can explain yeah. so maybe there's just not been enough communication because we kind of really want to talk with you know and share these ideas with the owners we don't presume the owners understand what we're thinking. We see these things all the time. This is their yeah. one experience, you know, and so it's really about communicating and just flagging that up, I think. Yeah, definitely. So maybe go and speak to your, your therapist, Nina. Yes. Um, Luke's Thank written, you, Nina. my dog has, my dog's therapy has never changed. She does the same every two weeks and has for about a year. Thanks for giving me a push. I will question it now. <laughs> Yeah, go oh, for it, Lee. If you're, yeah, so it depends, I suppose, if your dog is, is progressing and doing well with doing the same thing, then fantastic. But um, if you're not sure what you should be seeing, then yes, go and have a chat and, and yes. work together. And and also find out what are the goals, you know, what are, what are the aims, where are we going forward, what, you know, what else. And so it's it's not a swimming club. This is therapy and you will have yeah. episodes of care. And then you might be on a maintenance program for your wonderful elderly dog yes. um, or your senior dog. And, and that, that frequency is going to change. The duration might change. What they do may change. But it's all about fitting it and focusing it around what your dog needs. Yeah. It's and really if you're not sure. Dog. Yes. Go and chat. Because that might be yeah. exactly what your dog needs right now. So, yes. yeah, worth doing chatting. Um, was I just going up here? I missed one. Uh, oh, somebody, can I just say, I, can, I can't see the whole of it. Joe Hughes, she's interested to hear something about the sessions um, an hour long. I, I, again, it might be somebody new who wasn't here last. We're, we're all veterinary physiotherapists who specialize in hydrotherapy. So we offer an yeah. integrated package of physiotherapy and hydrotherapy within that session. So, and we, are, we do what the dog needs in that session. So we allow an hour. And if a dog needs a bit longer, they might need an hour and a quarter because we might have spent 10 minutes working with the dog at the beginning, you know, just doing some um, therapeutic touch and calming. So because we work with the dog's consent. So yeah. I, I think it's finding out what service you're having offered and then making your choices. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Amina has asked, we have a problem in hydrotherapy with a hyper young dog. Yes. Any tips how to settle him well? I know, I mean, this may be an arthritic young dog. You never know. But yes. Hello, whatever. Amina. Any from tips Poland. how to settle him well <laughs> and focus to slow down? Otherwise, I'm afraid we could do more harm than help. Which Do you have any tips there, Barbara? Yes. And, and I know Amina, um, she's, she's um, going through some advanced training and that's about using therapeutic handling, therapeutic touch, clinic enrichment, movement enrichment techniques. And we can use those with young dogs to make it a very positive experience and to give them, constrain them, but to get them moving in focus. And that's, that's all achievable. It's just a game like you say each dog's an individual so it's having mm -hmm. key points of control and understanding how to use them in water so these are all things that we kind of support professionals with to develop yeah so just keep yeah keep working at yeah. it I would <laughs> um 
Thank you for that. That's from Shannon. Idea of viewing corridor is awesome, Kenzie says. Uh, hi, just had 10. Um, this is from Sharon. Hi, we've just had 10 weeks hydrotherapy with my lab, Toby, as he has hip dysplasia with Stacey Robinson. Is there anything else I could be doing for him other than swimming? So I'm guessing you're meaning like hydrotherapy, um, I'm sorry, like physiotherapy, massage, acupuncture, that kind of thing, Sharon, I, I think. I, I, think, case, I, I think she has to go. I know Stacey. Uh, I don't know you, Sharon, but thank you so much for asking this question. You need to go and speak with Stacey and have a chat um, ab about different things and then maybe also have a chat with your vet. I, yeah. I think it's it needs to be multimodal and we work with the dog, but it also means you don't try everything on that dog. It's, yes, you can't do everything like on day one. Very, it needs you? to be really specific for the dog's needs. And if you're going to change something like anything, we need to do it gradually and, and with the dog's consent and, and working with all the therapists and professionals invested in your wonderful dog, Toby. Yeah. Yeah, so speak to Stacey and to your vet as well. Yes. Uh, I was interested that, yeah, here's, here's that one. I was interested to hear about your sessions being one hour with my dog currently in the pool for 12 minutes i'm wondering what i'm missing out on well yeah like like barbara said you know it's not all about the pool stuff and and it may be you, the, the dogs are not in the pool for an hour or in the treadmill for an hour their session their treatment session is one hour long and it, it's that integrated veterinary physiotherapy and hydrotherapy um and you know, so we do vet physio in water because I'm a vet physio. Well, I'm a human physio that did hydrotherapy. So, so you know, it's it's not that you're missing out on anything. That's the service that we offer and explain to our our owner clients. So, yeah. it don't feel so you're missing out on anything. If if yeah, if your dog is progressing and you've got a great relationship with your therapist, that's fantastic. It's yeah. not about the time. You know, we just allow that because we have a lot of complex dogs with a lot of behavioral issues because we see them so regularly. So we get right. referred a lot. And, you know, we have a lot of complex dogs as well. So that's our choice to offer that as a service. So and as long as you see progression, then yes. you know, as long as you're happy everybody, with what you're everybody, there, everybody's right. going to offer their own unique service because there are the no professionals are, no, and the, the professionals, well, they've got to be safe and effective, obviously, and be professional, but they're going to have their own particular niche or USP or um, expertise. So they'll offer a service that fits what they can offer to, to their area. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we're coming to the, the end of those. Um, there's one about insurance and I don't, I don't know the answer to this. I'm not sure whether we, <laughs> um, most insurance companies from Jane um, Faulkner, most insurance companies only cover a set amount number of sessions how do you negate around this or do you find the owners that come would come regardless i don't know i don't have any hello jane i know jane as well i don't okay. i don't quite follow that but we don't we don't book out like blocks we never have we book as we go along and um and also lots of our owners don't have insurance um, yeah. and the ones that do they're paying for it anyway you know, so they we work with what their cover they've got, and if they need more, then we've never really had yeah, that. Yeah. I've never really had that issue, but that all came from a long time ago because before there was huge claims by a small number of people who basically put in huge claims for extensive um, treatments. Um, the insurance companies kind of changed their policies, so. Mm. You know, so it's it's complicated, but I think yeah, we won't get too embroiled in that. I think I think if owners find <laughs> that it's beneficial, you know, they and they want to continue, they they will. Um, yeah. And we're not seeing all our dogs forever in a day. We have a lot of no. maintenance dogs that we see, a lot of senior dogs, but we also see dogs that come have a very high discharge rate. So they're not. It's not a club. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that's, that's probably covered most of the, those questions. If it hasn't, then it's probably because we're going to be chatting about it next week. Or again, over the weekend, I will have another look at all the questions and, and chat to Barbara next week before we go live. So, yes. and I was trying, again, I, Barbara. I, I know, I was so sorry. I overran last night and I was, I was, I finished in 40 that's minutes. Fine. I've done it. And then all the questions that's were like, okay, that's all right. I can There's always chatting. questions. Always questions, it. and that's great yeah. because that means people, um, you know, are taking a lot more away from it. So, Brilliant. thank you so much. Um, enjoy welcome. the rest of your evening, everybody, and yes, we'll hopefully bye. see you next Wednesday. Look forward. Take to care, it. everyone.
Bye. Bye.